I'm Melanie Parker, Google's Chief Diversity Officer. Thank you for joining us for Equity Talks, part of our equity learner journey to more deeply examine and understand social injustice through dialogue. U.S. Congressman John Lewis is a hero and a legend. His decades of leadership in advancing civil rights in America is simply unmatched. Today, we're pleased to put a spotlight on a new documentary that sheds new light on his story with thought-provoking interviews and rare archival footage. It's called John Lewis, Good Trouble, and you can watch it now. In today's Search for Racial Equity conversation, we welcome the film's director, Don Porter, and producer, Erica Alexander. They'll share insights on the importance of using storytelling to inspire everyone to take action and make an impact. The message is clear. It's time to get into a little good trouble ourselves. Oh, thank you all so much for being here. Um, Erica, Dawn, it is the thrill of a lifetime to speak with you about this film and about a trailblazer, Congressman John Lewis. I'm particularly excited to talk about this today because of the moment and growing movement for racial equity that we're in, not just in America, but around the world. So um, I don't think there could be a better time for us to be talking about this film, John Lewis, Good Trouble. So let's just jump right in. Does that work for you all? Yes, and thank you so much for doing this. We're just really thrilled to be here and uh, to you for leading this. Um, it's really important and we are so appreciative. Yes, thank you, Sharice. It's a pleasure. Cool. You're welcome, it's my pleasure. So let's just jump in. Walk us through the genesis of this film. Uh, what drew you to explore the life and legacy of a towering figure like Congressman John Lewis? And more importantly, how'd you go about assembling such a diverse cast of producers and collaborator, excuse me, collaborators to bring the story to life? You know, um, every film is really um, a collection of uh, good actors. And so um, I, I was interested, I had worked on a series about Bobby Kennedy and about John Lewis's involvement with Bobby Kennedy's run for the presidency. And in that, in that interview, John Lewis became the star of that four part series that I did for Netflix. W the, one of the stories that he told was John Lewis had set up the rally in Indianapolis for the African-American community um, for Bobby Kennedy. And on that day, Dr. King was assassinated. So Kennedy's advisors were saying to, to, to Kennedy that he should not address the black audience, that it was too dangerous, that there would be rioting and, and unrest. And it was a young John Lewis in his early 20s who said to, to then Senator Kennedy, you must address this audience. They need to hear from you. And Indianapolis was one of the only major cities that did not have rioting and looting. It also was the first time that Bobby Kennedy spoke publicly about John F. Kennedy's assassination. That night, the people in Indianapolis heard Senator Kennedy, and that was all on the advice of a young staffer named John Lewis. So, you know, when I did that series for Netflix, I started hearing those stories and so many other stories about John Lewis's life. And, you know, it just kind of stayed with me that John Lewis is often He's often kind of the side story to a larger civil rights story. And I really wanted to put him at the center of a story. That's amazing. And Erica, what made you want to get involved in this project? Um, I think, you know, overall, I'd like to say that John Lewis is like a magnet. He drew us to him, partly. Mm. I think that um, there's a certain kind of energy in the world that when it's time, uh, you know, it finds a way and it finds a path, certainly, um, Dawn has a career that uh, says that not only can she handle a big subject like this, that she's uniquely made to um, tell the story of John Lewis. And I was very happy to have met her. I had been campaigning with John Lewis in 2016 with Diana Preston and uh, Stacey Abrams. And um, he gave us a master class on what it was to be young, gifted, and Black in the South <laughs> with this icon who we all admired, but he was doing the work. He was on the ground doing the work, going from church to church, building to building, and we were following him 
and they had not yet made their national presence known. And so mm. uh, I think about that type of energy again, drawn to him to sort of reflect out. And so um, I stayed um, friendly with his office and uh, it turns out that Rachelle O'Neill had um, um, some interesting um, opportunity to help with the project. And uh, I ended up talking with my partner, um, Ben Arnon, we're at Color Farm with uh, John Porter. Maybe she would be interested. Now we were punching up at the time because we had never done a feature. And she would, she took not only our call, but she told us straight out that she had been wanting to do and was doing currently a project on John Lewis. And she suggested that we um, partner. And that was huge. It, it sort of is the door that I came in on. And she's been a fantastic mentor and helped to me to this day. I'm trying to start my directing career. And um, she has taught me how to be uh, a better director and not just an actress with the background, but how to, to promote myself and push myself forward and be confident in it. So again, that energy is pooling in us together, and certainly, I think John Lewis pulled us all together to make a really wonderful song out of his epic life. Mm, epic indeed. So, while this is an amazing story, we know that there are inherent challenges in making any film, but particularly making a documentary about a leader with a career as long and as, as eventful as John Lewis, uh, as Mr. Lewis. What challenges did that context present for you? You know, um, you're absolutely right. Um, mm -hmm. After you know, six decades of a public life lived and a life lived well, there was just, you know, a wealth of stories that we could tell about his life. So, you know, with every film I do, I try and find kind of a, a through line, an animating question. And for Mr. Lewis, I thought, people who know something about his life know about his broader, iconic, historical moments. But I really wanted to show that he is still here today as an active legislator, still make getting into good trouble on this time from in the halls of Congress instead of you know in the streets of, of the South. Um, but the other thing I really wanted to do is too often black um, activists are portrayed as brave and not strategic and intelligent. And I thought it was really important to point out his uh, strategy, his strategy yeah. and men, young men and women who worked with him in the civil rights movement, they were really political geniuses. When you think that a 19 year old was part of the architecture of desegregating Nashville, um, yeah. you know, a city that had been segregated for more than a hundred years, um, that is awesome. And mm -hmm. I wanted to point out um, how smart they were and to, to focus the attention on their strategy as well as on their braveness. It was not only bravery that integrated the South, it was strategy. Yeah, amazing. Um, as I look through thinking about the film, one of the most extraordinary moments of John Lewis' Good Trouble is the wealth of rare and never before seen footage, uh, archival material that you had in there. Uh, footage of Congressman Lewis in his early days, as you mentioned, as a young man on the front lines of the civil rights movement. What were some of his reactions when he first saw this footage? Um, you know, this was uh, one of the, uh, uh, just a really special moment. So um, Eric and I and the team, we were with the Congressman in Selma. He organizes uh, what he calls a pilgrimage each year to recreate and walk again in those steps that he took across that bridge with the other activists. So we were on that trip and we were filming Part of that trip we uh, was a visit to Brian Stevenson's Civil Rights Museum. And while we were in that museum, the Congressman was watching a, a, an exhibit that was about him. And he was watching it and he turned to a teenager who was also just randomly in the museum. And he said, I can't believe that's me. And he started telling a story about that, that scene. So can you imagine? being in the Civil Rights Museum and John Lewis is next to you, telling you a story that no one's ever heard about that day. And it just really stayed with me. So 
one of the things I wanted to do, you know, you talked about the challenges. One of the challenges is he's told many stories you know, the same way, you know, over the years, because everyone wants to know what it was like on the bridge, what it was like in the Freedom Rides. So I was thinking as a director, how do I get him to really go back in time and give us some more texture of that day? So we rented a stage in Washington, D.C., the arena stage, and we constructed with the brilliant editor, Jessica Congdon, who edited the film, we constructed the little mini movies of just pure archival of his life and then sat him in a darkened theater. And then I asked him to tell me the story of those moments. And in doing that, he reacted to some of the footage he saw. He told us um, things that he had never seen before. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I really do believe that he was seeing himself a little bit in the way that we see him. He was seeing the totality of so many small and large moments of his life. And I, and I, my hope was that it would help him understand our love for him, why we mm -hmm. see him as such a hero. And it was because John Lewis consistently and over time and repeatedly showed up. He just showed mm -hmm. up. And when your audience is thinking about their fight for racial equality, the fight for racial you know, um, integrity, part of it is showing up. It's not allowing things that seem small, not allowing all of those things to, to go by, not participating in, in racial um, humor, not making assumptions or stereotyping people based on, you know, race, gender, you know, or, or other human qualities. So, but he was uh, quite taken with some of that imagery. And I also think that that helped our bond you know, I think they really appreciated the effort um, that really went into respect for an elder, you know, like this, yeah. this is how I see you. And this is what you mean, not only to me, but to my children and, you know, to so many other um, Americans. Yes. And I think we really can do that. For, oh, sorry, Erica, go ahead. You know, Dawn did a yeoman's job of setting this man up like a, the hero he is, but like Marvel would, a great character <laughs> in his entrance. Erica's just trying to give me a job. And it's true. No, 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 not at all. And, and please, larger than life. And then he's in the middle of it, smack dab, in, his, in the spotlight. And I think that to me, I love that she puts him in a setting, like a diamond in the setting and says, this is your life. And he gets to be sort of you know, um, pulled in and again, absorb that energy that he's put out for so many years. I was taken aback by the um, immense awesomeness, awesomeness of that day. It was, it was a fantastic day. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about being a superhero and the reaction of watching his response to his moments, I'm struck by the moment in the film near the end where you show his interaction with everyday people be it walking through an airport or through the streets of DC and that combination of awe and appreciation on the face of everyone from every background. Uh, it's just extraordinary and for him to have the moment to not just experience that in his real life, but look back and literally see what caused that awe, that had to be extraordinary. It, you know, it really was um, and uh, after the, the film was finished, we learned of his diagnosis with pancreatic cancer. Um, and, you know, it just, it just really kind of rocked all of us um, because we had spent so much time with him and, and in his story. But I did get the opportunity to go to, I flew to his house in DC and share the film with him, which is always, you know, <laughs> a little bit anxiety provoking because a person doesn't have to like it. Um, yeah. So, but I feel like like that had to be my bravery. I had to like sit there and you know wait for him to grade my paper. Um, so, but you know we had a really special afternoon where he just kept saying, "This is so powerful, so powerful." And you know, I said, "Mr. Lewis, your life is powerful. Like it's your life that's powerful. Um, you know, you, there's no, you don't need to amp up anything with the story of John Lewis. It is an awe-inspiring American story um, of somebody who, for love of other people and for love of country, 
um, set out on a journey. Mm -hmm. And it's holding up a mirror, right? You simply held up a mirror to the life and accomplishments of a great man. So that's incredible. I'm so glad you had that opportunity to yeah. share that with him, see his reaction. Yeah. Um, the film contains so many other testimonials from some of the biggest names in American politics, um, congressional newcomers like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to Rashida Tlaib, Diana Presley, Ilan Omar, uh, civil rights movement giants like James Clyburn and the late uh, Elijah Cummings, as well as Stacey Abrams, Eric Holder, Cory Booker, Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> Presidents Carter, oh, Clinton, Hillary Clinton. It just keeps going. Um, what was it like hearing about Mr. Lewis's legacy from his contemporaries, as well as the next generation of lawmakers? Um, you know, that was, um, and Erica was there for a lot of those interviews um, as well. And um, it was, you know, the feeling of hearing a story from an elder that just grabs your attention. And for all of these people, you know, we filmed in like kind of a marathon Capitol Hill day where people kept coming one after the other. So they were coming in and telling these stories in between votes. Um, mm -hmm. And it just was not, you know, sometimes people say we, nothing has changed and we haven't, you know, advanced. And that's not true. I mean, we had mm -hmm. Elijah Cummings in Congress. We have Representative Clyburn, who's the Democratic whip. Um, we have, mm -hmm. you know, the AOC and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, but to hear those stories, what I really wanted to do was have a variety of voices, to have the newer members of Congress, Senator Booker um, and the Ayanna Presley, but also to have his peers. And, you know, Elijah Cummings, Representative Elijah Cummings, was the first interview that we did for this film. And I'm so glad that that is the case because he set the bar so high um, when he spoke from the heart about his love for his fellow representative. And I think that that is rare in politics and in the world of, of work. And I certainly hope that people I work with, you know, want to come and talk about what I have contributed um, to the workplace, you know, not just sing his praises, but they all spoke of his contributions. Um, when Elijah per Cummings says, you know, it's his honor to be mistaken for a great man. And we know what a great man Elijah Cummings was. Um, when Jim Clyburn says, John Lewis is the most, you know, is the bravest person I know. And we know what a, a representative Clyburn has done in his life. Um, those are not hollow, that is not hollow praise. That is really um, deep praise. And I think that that is a signal about our life well lived. You know, Mr. Lewis does not brag about his accomplishments. He is the most humble person that you will meet. And um, so I think his friends and colleagues know that. And so they really, would say what he would not say about himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Erica, what was it like for you interfacing and, and hearing the stories from these amazing lawmakers from the, the current and future, right? And the past. Yeah, they it was amazing. Um, again, you know, every day you're um, thinking about history, but this is living history. Presidents, um, Hillary Clinton, who's run to be, who had run to be the first woman president, um, everybody that uh, Don mentioned, they were there to bear witness about John Lewis. And Bill Clinton came up and he said to me, he says, I appreciate the opportunity. He said, thank you to talk about John Lewis. He changed my life. He said, he saved my life. And uh, so this was something that he thought he not only wanted to uh, get an opportunity to talk about a man he admired, but he felt an obligation toward and to, to lift him up because uh, he had been so instrumental in some part of you know, his life that you know, I'm sure that they know about and um, that's personal to him. And I'm glad because we know that John Lewis has skin in the game. I mean, he really does work hard every day to defend and protect the right of everyone every day. And um, I love that 
they know besides the fact that they've marched over those bri that bridge with him, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that they're trying so hard now to change the name for, that he shed tears, blood to keep um, the boat safe. I mean, he's truly what makes America great. And he's trying to maintain the conditions for freedom and justice. And all these people who have been gladiators and, and you know, in this, in this arena said, we're here to, um, to pay tribute to a great man. So, you know, you just get out their way and the way and let them tell their story. And that's what Dawn did. And they felt very comfortable. The minute they got into that space, you could feel, like when Sheila Jackson Lee came on and sat down, you knew that, you know, this is one of the first, she's one of the first graduating classes, uh, actually the first graduating class from Yale of lawyers, black, black, black female. These are these types of firsts coming and talking about John Lewis and um, and loving him. They, they love mm. him. Yeah, we were filmed, uh, so, sorry, we filmed um, the, um, the swearing in of the Black Caucus and it mm -hmm. is, a record-breaking Black Caucus, 55 members for the first time. And Sheila Jackson Lee on that historic occasion said to Mr. Lewis, which we picked up on the mic, you need to, to know what part you had in this. And that mm -hmm. just gave me chills for her. We were not doing an interview. That was not for our cameras. She said that to him as an aside and we were in the back and heard it. So the authenticity right. of praise and respect um, was just, you know, palpable, like throughout our time in doing those interviews. Mm -hmm. And one of the most powerful moments for me in the film was when Mr. Lewis was going through his home and he picked up the book about President Barack Obama. And he recounted the story of at the first inauguration, he handed the president a slip of paper asking for an autograph like any <laughs> film would do, right? And he wrote, it's because of you, John. And then at the second inauguration, gave him another note that said, it's still because of you. That was one of the main moments in the film where I really got a chance to see him reflecting on his impact. So to see that on the film was really what you saw throughout the filmmaking process as he was watching his life play out in front of him. It's just a beautiful thing to see. So Erica, I have to say, I just noticed as we were talking about the moment where President Obama wrote the note to Mr. Lewis, you got very emotional. Talk to us about that. Uh, yeah. Um, um, well, I'll say that um, when you said it and you put together the first time that John Lewis uh, asked and put his hand out for the first black president to sign the program, um, his program for the inauguration, and he wrote, you know, it's it's because of you, John. And then the second time that he did it, and it said, still because of you, it was overwhelming because mm. this transfer of of ancestry from one black man to another, mm. and you know how hard it was for him to get there. Yeah, and you see the light of Obama, which is beautiful. When I say his countenance, his presence, his smile, you see the weariness of John Lewis, mm -hmm. the burden of presenting this beautiful light to the world, rest on this man's shoulder along with Martin Luther King and Emmett Till mm -hmm. and Annie Lou Hamer and all these people. And we continue that because George Floyd has a piece in that. You know, um, Breonna Taylor has a piece in that that we keep lifting the best version of our American self, mm -hmm. but the path that it had to cross to get there is a lot of wonderful stories, and a lot of pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. He wrote that and um, he hands it to somebody who's uh, by all accounts lived his best life mm -hmm. for the rest of us. I'm glad, I'm just glad to be a part of it in some way to touch that part of history. And, um, uh, and uh, it touches you. Mm -hmm. You realize that we're living history mm -hmm. and um, we have a, an opportunity and a responsibility to do what uh, John Lewis called, um, you know, getting into good trouble and 
I say that it's an act of living an example of courage and faith, right action. And he calls it good trouble. And so I think even this discussion is, an, is a version of getting into good trouble, necessary trouble. So yes. thank you for putting it that way because sometimes we need to see it just plain and simple mm -hmm. to, to touch us and move us forward. Mm -hmm. um, the film pays particular attention to a subject that's most closely associated with Mr. Lewis's tenure in politics, the Voting Rights Act. Many of his early activities were centered on gaining access to the vote. Can you talk about that battle and how, particularly in this moment, empowering people to get out to vote is more important than ever? Yes. Um, you know, as many people know, John Lewis was an activist um, during the time when President Johnson was considering the Voting Rights Act, largely considered the singular piece of legislation that uh, improved access to the vote. Um, you know, Mr. Lewis told us in, for example, in Mississippi, after the Voting Rights Act, the percentage of African-American vote went from, it just increased like 500%. I mean, this is truly land, you know, breaking legislation. And in the time that he has been in Congress and since this current administration has been in Congress and actually even before with the current Supreme Court um, decision in Shelby County versus Holder, uh, the Voting Rights, Act, Voting Rights Act is gutted. The way that it was gutted is to remove the requirement that uh, states that had been under that had, you know, had a, a history of discrimination would have to have any action that would be taken that could suppress the vote would have to be cleared through the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, um, states were much less likely to do things that would interfere with the vote. 2013, mm -hmm. that decision happens and we see a raft of actions at the state level um, that we know did suppress minority turnout. So John Lewis saw the legislation be enacted in the mm -hmm. 60s. Then he saw it be successful for mm -hmm. four decades. And then he saw it taken away. And now he's seeing the result of that. So 2018, we have a scene in the film where the first piece of legislation introduced, HR1, mm -hmm. was to reauthorize the Voting Act, Rights Act. I mean, can you imagine being the person who worked on the original legislation and then to have to reauthorize it as you were about to turn 80, mm -hmm. that is what Hillary Clinton said when she said, we are going backwards. Mm -hmm. So um, that was, it was really important to me to show not only that he's still working, but that he's, he is still resolved, he is still engaged and he is still effective. So that was, uh, you know, it's really, really crucial kind of, message of the of the film which is that we cannot afford to relax or take our eyes off of the ball if you care about racial equity you have to be vigilant and you have to be active mm -hmm. yeah so um right now as we're filming this we are in the midst of a growing movement for racial equity based on the increasing and ongoing violence against black bodies in the United States and around the world. And while the George Floyd murder was just one example, it seems that the eyes of the world are on racial justice right now. Um, so how can we seize this moment and translate it into longer term impact? How can individuals help maintain that momentum? Erica, I'd love to hear from you on that. Um. Well, here's what I've learned um, in quarantine <laughs> and uh, we'll take with me on the road. That racial, ju racial justice is a moving target. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a one and done thing. Um, democracy is a living, breathing organism. It's um, tied to a life force that we must nurture. And if we nurture it badly, it dies. It mm -hmm. doesn't offer. And so what you're seeing is a huge, um, like boom, like people putting their life force into it and say, oh no, we're going to you know, palpitate and do whatever we need to do to massage this heart and, and move forward. I've been 
um, really pleased lately to meet a lot of wonderful people who are working really hard on that. And Reverend Barber is one of them. Reverend William Barber has been doing the Poor People's Campaign. And he talks about, we need to have a moral um, reckoning in America and around the world. And he says that muscle has atrophied, mm. you know, morality in all this. The racial justice, we're not talking about it for other people. You talk about it, you defend it perhaps on behalf of another person, but you assure it for yourself. Mm. So that's what we're talking about. It's good to see the huge um, groups of black, brown, gay, straight, um, uh, Southern, Northern, East, West, um, the, the young people, the Zoomers, the Boomers, they're all out there and they're putting their bodies and um, health on the line because we're in the middle of something that the world has never been inside of all at the same time. So I'm really hopeful when I think about that because sometimes you can get down and say, oh, forget it, we're gonna keep, it's like Groundhog's Day, we're gonna keep boomeranging. But the truth is John Lewis shows us that he, by his consistent and disciplined um, work, that this is something that you can't, that, um, that must be worked on every day like you would nurture a plant. We must mm -hmm. nurture our country and our global health in that way. Mm -hmm. And something that Eric Holder said in the film, I'm looking at my notes because this was so powerful to me. He said, this is not a time for despair. This is a time for action. This is what I learned from John Lewis. So Erica, as you talk about, you know, yes, there's a lot going on. Yes, we're moving back. Yes, we are on life support for democracy and justice but we can't just bemoan the situation. We have to take action to keep justice alive, to keep our democracy living and vibrant. Uh, Don, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this moment and the actions we need to take. I'm really glad that you reference um, uh, Attorney General, former Attorney General Holder, because he is um, you know, a spectacular example of someone who left one form of public service and now is engaging in another with his voter protection efforts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I um, tend to be of the optimistic school of life um, mm -hmm. where, you know, I do see and I do take great um, comfort in the idea that this moment does feel different. Mm. It feels like we are willing to have a conversation before I feel like it was black people forcing the conversation often. Mm. People of other races as well, but often it was up to us to inject the conversation when it where it needed to be injected. And now I feel like we have more people asking for the conversation. And I think that that is very hopeful. The other thing that is extremely hopeful is young people get it right away. Um, they're they they're beyond us in you know we're asking what what did I miss, <laughs> and they're saying what can we do. Mm -hmm. So um, you know I I look at my kids. I look at you know the other young people I know, and I'm so excited at their creativity. Um, and their interest, mm -hmm. you know, um, they are doing this for themselves, for the future that they want to have. So I, I also think the fact that you are doing this panel today means there is interest and there is, um, you know, a need for conversations, for real conversations. I did um, a really fun interview the other day with um, kid film critics and uh, a nine-year-old girl said, uh, you know, her question was, what can nine-year-olds do? <laughs> Which I thought was, you know, and, and what I said to her, I think applies to all of us too. It's if you are nine, you can be the person in the group that does not participate in racist humor. You can be the kind person in the room. You yeah. can ask yourself if there are things that you maybe don't know. You can ask yourself why you have certain responses to things. And you can ask your friends and colleagues and people that you know um, to help you in that in that quest. And I think, you know, for too long we've gone to work and you know we're all supposed to be the same. We're not the same. We mm -hmm. have different backgrounds and experiences and that is what what that is why we want to be together to mm -hmm. share. 
So mm -hmm. I, I am hoping that people will bring more of their full selves to work, mm -hmm. um, that they will ask questions rather than make speeches, mm -hmm. uh, and that they, you know, perhaps will let some of the quieter voices speak up mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, let's maybe do some more listening. Mm -hmm. And then I know I often tell people, you know, I have a number of white friends, very close white friends, and I've had some people say, "What can I do? What can I learn?" You know, and I say, "You can Google." Again, <laughs> so you know what you can do? Google. That's what you can do. Google the good books. Do your research. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you talked about a nine-year-old asking what she can do in this moment. I want to take us back to your early life, maybe not as nine-year-olds, but thinking back in the documentary, we learned quite a bit about Mr. Lewis's childhood and his experiences growing up in the South. Can Erica, we'll start with you. Can you please tell us about a story growing up that led you to the work that you're doing today? Um. Sure. Um, I, to, to, to tell my story, I have to tell a little bit of my parents' story. Um, mm -hmm. I, my mother was a teacher. You're into public education, too. You appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, she was, uh, both my parents were orphans. I'm one of mm -hmm. six, and I spent the first 11 years of my life in a hotel called Starlight off of Route 66. My father mm -hmm. was an itinerant preacher, and he earned his living going around to churches where they would invite him and then they would pass around a plate and he'd get the offering after everyone else took from the building fund, from the first lady's fund, from all that. And often he would preach a set of revivals in, um, and we lived in Arizona up in the mountains. Um, we we uh, were like a whole week and maybe get $60. So we did a lot of dumpster diving and driving into going to powwows and picking up cans and bottles. And that's how we would help to um, supplement, su um, supplement the income. And I started working when I was five years of age, knocking on doors, asking people to take out their trash, sweep their porch. We get a quarter or 50 cents. And if, when it snowed, my brothers would uh, shovel and they would make uh, maybe $20, which was mythological. And that's how I lived my life. But my parents, they um, struggled so much to make a way for us. And I don't say this as a sad story. This is an American story. Um, it's where I come from. And I can't um, imagine a life where I don't think about others or to be in service of someone to mm -hmm. grow. And, and my growth needs to be um, a, a selfish act. No, it needs to be a selfless act to find ways to, to learn from my own mistakes and move forward because they did. Um, and they did it with very little um, help and education. They went to Bible college and they you know, lived in their car. And again, people mm -hmm. garages. And then they got us because the German Lutherans saw him and said, you know what, you're really good, uh, Robert Lee Murray, made, named after a Confederate general and sent mm -hmm. him to the Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. And suddenly I get a chance to be in a larger place where suddenly a, a, a summer program, someone found me Merchant Ivory and gave me the lead in a movie. And I've got now a SAG card with health care and benefits and a way to go. But I remember how many people auditioned for that big general call, how many girls didn't. Thousands of girls from the tri-state area weren't picked. And so I told myself, I had a little bit of survivor's remorse and said that I would do everything I could to lift mm -hmm. those voices and find a way to bring resources and um, um, uh, some kind of uh, access to mm -hmm. uh, the people who could help. And um, so that's why Color Farm is around. Um, that's why it matters that we uh, think about marginalized and the pipeline and that we know that our best Beethovens and Shakespeare's and Maya Angelou's are yet undiscovered. And, um, you know, and that's my, that's my goal in life. So my childhood has spawned my entire uh, mission. And I appreciate the sacrifices my mother made for me to, have, to be here talking with the both of you. You talk so much about living history. And earlier in the conversation, Dawn mentioned having the first interview for the film with Representative Elijah Cummings before he passed away. And then talking about learning of uh, Representative Lewis's pancreatic cancer diagnosis right before showing the film to him. My grandfather was a preacher. Ooh. and always talk about giving people their flowers while they're here. Mm. 
when I look at this entire film, I have goosebumps just thinking about it. You gave this man his flowers while he is here. <laughs> Right? He had the opportunity to sit back and reflect literally in moving pictures around him on that soundstage, reflect on a life well lived, mm. reflect on a history of good trouble. Mm. And you gave that gift to him. I hope that you can hold on to that. I, I thank you for saying that. Um, I will make it my business to, to hold on to that. This moment is very difficult for a lot of people um, are suffering um, job losses, death, um, reevaluating their career, their lives. And I get to be a part of this discussion. And um, I don't think that's, um, <clears throat> I don't take it for granted. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This was just a pleasure. Something I think about when I look at Mr. Lewis's life Sure. is a legacy of respect. He was a, is a deeply spiritual man, respectful to everyone from the people in the airport who approach him to his counterparts on the other side of the hall. When, um, when I think about what we do here at Google, the foundation of all of our work, but particularly the racial equity work we're doing right now, and this, the premiere of our Search for Racial Equity series, mm. Respect is critical to everything we do, respecting the user, respecting the opportunity, but most importantly, respecting each other. Yes. In this moment, what role does respect play as we look to drive racial equity and honor the living history that is the life of Mr. John Lewis? Um, I think it takes, they say it takes a village, but I think it takes a nation. Mm. to do what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And the nation includes all our institutions, whether it's educational, religious, sports, foundational, traditional, uh, theatrical outlets, what I do um, in, in, um, in the living arts, creative arts. We have to work together to innovate new ways for us to collaborate, partner with each other. Mm -hmm. um, you came to the, um, uh, and said, let's do something together for John Lewis inside of a program that you had created talking about racial equity. And mm -hmm. that right there is a partnership to, um, <clears throat> I think, to an end to talk about a man and about a film and a documentary. There's also a way to think about us as the beloved community that he worked toward, that mm -hmm. you know it, it wouldn't matter where we worked or how we were working, that we could work together. And mm -hmm. so, um, I'm glad that in a way, we're finding new ways of discussing and having this discussion um, and m making new communities and different programs come together because we're stronger together. There's no doubt about it. And it will take a nation. So this is this is the innovation that's happening now and all the, the new types of conversations and discussions that will hopefully take place no matter what afterwards. We need to continue because um, Google is not just a search button. It's often a it's, it's a pathway to energy and um, information and perhaps to empathy because you if you know more you do better, and mm -hmm. so that's important. Mm -hmm. I want to end talking about hope. We talked a little earlier that uh, Mr. John Lewis he really focused on hope and encouraging us to stay hopeful. Yeah. Sometimes it's easier said than done, particularly when they're in the, we're in the middle of a I don't know a a COVID global pandemic and strife around the world. What are some things that you're doing to stay hopeful in general and in this moment in particular? Um, well, you know, uh, I, I, I try to, uh, that's a difficult question. It is, right? <laughs> I'm just being honest, it's hard to stay hopeful because sometimes you think you're <clears throat> making headway and you know that you're, um, Again, my survival was tied and linked to everyone's behavior, good, mm -hmm. bad, or ugly. You know, um, this. You know, uh, we are all in the same boat. That's you know, it's true. Um, some are in yachts, some are in canoes. <laughs> <laughs> no, other, some have a hole in the boat. <laughs> the rope, but they, you know, in the same storm, in the mm -hmm. same storm. So we have to remember those who have less. And I'm trying to make sure that I'm doing my part right now, wherever I am, even in front of a Zoom call or talking about somebody, to make sure that 
it, it's about everyone and not just about a self uh, selfish act. It's selfless. I don't need any self promotion. I need to feel um, that I'm again collaborating and having a conversation that's greater than me. I don't have children. You have two sons, and I think about your sons when I make my decision. You know, I, I don't need to have your sons for them to become mine. They're precious. They're beyond um, all words. That uh, children are precious, but if we teach them wrong things, then our you know decisions today you know, doom them tomorrow. So I will make sure that um, I think the hopeful thing I can do is act in good faith for others. And then for myself, God willing, the creek don't rise, it'll pay off. As we wrap up, I'd love to get any closing thoughts. Dawn, let's start with you. Um, I just would really like to thank you for a really, um, valuable and moving conversation. I appreciate um, the respect with which you've uh, treated this film and I, I just am very deeply appreciative. Um, and I would like to encourage anyone who is watching and having time to reflect, um, you know, that can start at home. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the benefits that we have being um, you know, kind of having more time at home is to really think about our own values mm -hmm. and to think about the values that, that we want to put into the world. So um, it was the experience of a lifetime to make this movie and I'm so grateful that it's gonna be in the world. And I cannot thank all of you enough for helping to spread the word about Good Trouble. It was our pleasure, thank you so much. Are there any parting words you'd like to leave with the audience about the film or or anything at all? Uh, yes, I want thing I want to thank everybody who's supported the film and um, uh, the work of John Lewis to this point. Um, I know there are many people out there who are looking at this discussion who know him, who have done good works with him, and we appreciate that you've done that, and we hope that you see yourself in this film and to everyone else that you're learning about John Lewis. Um, and as you go and look at more, not only civil rights, but how we got here through American history and world history, you know that he earned his good trouble moniker and that icon status by committing his life to the fight for civil rights and, um, and justice for all. And he did it armed with the courage of his convictions, mm -hmm. um, the abiding philosophy of nonviolence, he did it through unrelenting peaceful protests and a love for the beloved community. And I believe that we need to take those lessons onto our um, reshaping of this next moment. And so um, that's what John Lewis would say, to keep moving, mm -hmm. keep moving. Don't let no dust settle at your feet. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Great parting words. Thank you so much, Erica. Thank you, appreciate mm -hmm. you. Learn about Google's equity learner journey on diversity.google.com and sign up to learn about new episodes.